welcome and thank you for coming. We are STSU Mighty Mouse. We are another Micro Mouse competition team. Uh, we are comprised of Tarek, Brian Liu, David, myself, Brian Snow, Albert, and Mai. So some of you may be wondering, if you didn't catch it, what is a Micro Mouse competition? So our goal is to solve a 16 by 16 cell maze comprised of 18 by 18 centimeter cells. A couple of rules we have to follow are we cannot destroy or harm the walls in any way. We can't go over the walls and we can't leave any part of our robot behind. Now, uh, so the shortest time to the center is our actual final time. So we can spend, you know, nine minutes and 50 seconds actually mapping the maze out. But if we go from the start to the finish from 9.50 to 9.59, nine seconds would be our actual final time. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what our presentation is going to be on. Uh, we're going to go over our board design with you. Uh, we're going to go over the maze solving algorithm, which is how we're actually solving the maze. Uh, our block diagram, which shows all of our hardware working together. Then we'll go into detail about that hardware. And that should do it. So now I'd like to pass it on to David. We'll give you our design. So for our design, we set to create a three-layer board design. For our top layer, you can see the sensing and receiving. For our middle layer, for processing. And for our bottom layer, for our power set. For our top layer, we set to have emitters, receivers, and one more indication at least to tell us how fast we're going and when we're turning. And we have the ground, which is for our analog components, to not gain interference from the uh, losing component on the bottom board. And we put the sensors on the bottom uh, board, or the bottom layer, to sense the middle of the wall. For the me middle layer, we set to go to the nuclear board, because it's compatible in size for our design. All the pins all laid out for us, we can just mimic it. And it's a good size, because it will fit in the main easy for us. And it's, it's a brain of our mouse, it controls the top and bottom layer. So on the bottom layer, as you can see, we have our battery, battery wheels, decoder, and base bridge. This is a consider for our noisy components, and this is what drives our mouse. And we'll pass it to Terry for the the Thank you, David. So I'll be talking about the maze solvent algorithm. We decided to go with the modified plot filter instead of the classic plot filter. Um, in this slide, I'll talk about the similarities and the concept behind the algorithm. In the next slide, I'll talk about why we chose the modified plot filter. So as you can see in the picture, um, the concept uses the water flowing from high to low rotation. And the top of this stairs is the starting point, and the bottom is the center of the maze. So the algorithm floods the maze at the start, and it assigns each cell a value, and the higher the value, the higher the elevation. So it knows how to reach the center. The problem is how it knows where the walls are. As you can see in the next slide, I'll explain why we chose the modified. Um, the difference is that the modified blood flow floods the maze at the starting point. After that, it calculates and computes the estimation um, when it hits a wall, then it updates the distance. In contrast, the um, classic blood flow floods the maze with each move the mouse takes. So that requires more computations, more memory. So that's why we chose the modified flood curve, because it takes less memory and less computation, and therefore it, it moves faster when the mouse doesn't need any computation. Um, and the table here, we have these data is from the IEEE Region 6 2012 competition. Although all the algorithms have the same number of travel cells, the number of computations way, way large in the classic. That's why we're speaking with the modified plot. In the next slide, I'll talk about the amazing <coughs> progress we accomplished. Um, we started off by generating an empty maze, and from there, we started by uh, designing and implementing different mazes and different scenarios. So by the time we get to the competition, we'll be sure that the, maze, the algorithm is actually working perfectly. Um, right now, we have the algorithm working, so it finds the center of the maze, keeps exploring and visiting all the cells, so it makes sure that the shortest path is actually found. Um, and it also marks dead end routes, so that will save time when we are actually solving this. In the next slide, um, here is our version of uh, simulation algorithm actually working. Looks, the mouse starts on the bottom left and keeps exploring until it finds the center of the maze. After I find the center, it keeps visiting all the unvisited cells to make sure that the shortest path is actually found. And 
invested for our resourcing of plastic related structural So I'm going to give you a brief description of what we're at. So we're a power supply of 74 volts, which is part of our uh, H3 and our fiber regulator. We need fiber regulators that are needed to only give you 5 volts. So from our nuclear to our H3, a PWM signal, and from there, the H bridge gets to control the speed of our DC motors from that PWM signal. So, from the DC motors to the encoder, how, to, how that is sent message through the all effect sensor, what that does when the DC motor starts to spin, it's going gener to generate a mag magnetic field, and from there, the sensor will output a variable voltage, and since the encoder from the encoder, this is another signal to the video. And the receivers and emitters work in a pair, so this is light. Brian Liu will go in detail with that. So for our sensors, we decided to go with the photodiode and phototransistor pair. So what the photodiode does is it emits out a light in a cone shape, which is then taken in by the phototransistor. The phototransistor serves as a receiver. We will have four of these pairs, two facing the front walls, telling us how far we are from the front walls to the mouse, and two pairs facing the side walls, telling us how far we are from the side walls to the mouse, and indicating to us when we get up wall to no wall transition. So to determine how far we are away, we will be taking in readings from the receiver, and the receiver will display a voltage to us, uh, correlating to us uh, how much light is getting taken in to the receiver. So as you can see from the graphs at the bottom, the closer the mouse is to the wall, the higher voltage we will be reading. This could be explained because explained by how the emitted light has less time to dissipate. So as for the here's an example of our front sensors working. As you can see, as the mouse moves forward, the voltage peak on the receiver increases, which is the green waveform. Next, I'll be talking to you guys about uh, how we will be implementing these sensors. So we will be posting these sensors one by one. We will have three separate pulses. One pulse for the left side of the wall, one pulse for the right side of the wall, and one pulse for the front sensors. Uh, from the video up top, you can see that our front sensors are pulsing on, again, shutting off, and again, pulsing back on. So, looking at our sensors pulsing timing diagram, so the emitter turns on for 30 microseconds and displays a, or it shoots out a light, which then the receiver charges up during that 30 microseconds and takes in a voltage, the voltage peak. Once the emitter shuts off, the receiver will start to discharge. And after the 30 microseconds, uh, it will send a, it will have a second pulse to the next emitter. So what we will be doing with these uh, converted values are, or values are storing it into the ADC buffer and taking the converted values and using it to adjust the velocity and position of the mouse. Next, I'll be passing on to Brian Snow for our H bridge. Thank you, Brian. So I want to talk to you all a little bit about our H bridge. Now our H bridge is actually our motor driver, it's how our motors are going to spin. It's going to receive a PWM, a pulse width modulation, from the microcontroller. Now that'll adjust the motor speed. The reason we need an H bridge is if you were to just hook two wires, uh, a voltage and a ground, up to a motor, it would only spin in one direction. You can tell in the top right here, when the diodes are switched on and off, uh, and if diode 1 and 4 are on, it'll spin forward, whereas 3 and 2 are on, it'll spin backwards. So that's how we're going to get forward and reverse to make uh, rotations. And now I'll go into a little more detail about why we're using our DC motors instead of stepper. We thought the advantages of the DC motor would outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, our, our DC motor is lightweight, it's uh, high efficiency, it's got low power consumption, and it's got great speed, a lot higher speed than the stepper motor would be. However, some of the disadvantages, the stepper motor can work with an open loop. However, we need to use a closed loop feedback, uh, which needs tuning, and it's uh, pretty difficult to implement. So another problem is the uh, motors actually require a little more maintenance with the gears uh, rotating and spinning on each other. But we, we thought the advantages would outweigh our disadvantages. So going into more detail about what we use, we have a 7.4 volt nanotech battery. This battery uh, is small, it's lightweight enough for our micro mouse, but the 180 milliamp per hour discharge gives us about 13 to 15 minutes of driving time, which is a lot more than we need for the 10 minute maximum. So if you've ever noticed with any of your hardware, as you've been running it, the voltage will actually, the output voltage will decrease a little bit as the charge lessens. So we've actually programmed into our mouse 
to work around that so that it will always be working on the same voltage. As for our motor, we're using a 30 to 1 micro metal gear motor. It's a good combination of speed and torque. We, we tested a few different motors. The 10 to 1 had great speed but low torque, which means low acceleration, whereas the 50 to 1 uh, gear ratio gave great torque, great acceleration, but the top end speed wasn't what we were looking for. So that's, like I said, going to be driven by the pulse width modulation through the H bridge from the microcontroller, and it'll be spinning our 3D custom printed wheels. As you can see in this video here, uh, take special notice of the oscilloscope. If you see, the oscilloscope is, uh, there you go. You see a pulse going through there, and that's actually reading the motor, or I'm sorry, the wheel spinning against the encoder, which Albert will go into more detail about now. I think right. So that's why I said for DC motors, we need a feedback loop, and one of the feedbacks we're going to provide is an encoder. Our encoder uh, is basically a speedometer on the car. It tells us the position and speed that the wheels are moving. Uh, we use magnetic encoders, it's a pretty cool concept. Uh, we have a magnetic ring, as you can see in the top left picture. It has 44 north and south poles, so 22 pole pairs. And every time the north pole passes over the Hall effect sensor, which is a chip uh, that's you know, frictionless and sits uh, sitting still, uh, a, north, uh, a side wave is created. As you can see in the top right, um, that's a frequency modulated sine wave, and which is basically what our integrated circuit is seeing. If you zoom in on part of that sine wave, I chose a portion of the sine wave that's shown as decelerating. The frequency of the sine wave is getting slower. And the integrated circuit part of it, uh, on the next slide, it turns that into a, um, a square wave, so the microcontroller can count the pulses. So at this point, we're still at one-to-one -one ratio, 22 pulses per revolution. But the unique thing about this um, integrated circuit, this encoder chip, is it gives it 40 times multiplier and it, in the interpolating circuit. And that gives us a lot more accuracy, uh, especially when we count the rising and falling edge. We get 1,760 counts per revolution. Uh, basically what that boils down to, with a wheel circumference of 116 millimeters and the 1,760 counts per revolution, we get a precision of 66 micrometers. And this chip is also accurate up to a speed of 6 miles per hour, which is a lot faster than we're going to use. Uh, to go more into the microcontroller, and the feedback signal is mine. Okay, so what we have here is a control loop that happens in the microcontroller. Uh, the control interrupts every single 5 milliseconds. We will sample the IR sensor first. Then um, the voltage analog value will be converted to digital and it will determine if we are close to a wall or not. Next, we're going to sample the encoders. The encoders are the um, total counts per revolution. That will give us the total distance from the center of cell to the next cell. Um, with these two feedbacks, we're, um, we're able to determine the speed and direction for the mouse to travel. If there's a wall there, it'll update the modified buckle algorithm, as in updating the cell's distance and determining if it should turn or if it should um, pivot and turn back. And with that, the microcontroller will um, produce a pulse width modulation that will go into the H bridge that will control the left and right folders. And that concludes our block diagram. And I'll pass it to Albert to discuss about the cost analysis. All right, so now that you guys know a little bit about our mouse, uh, the cost of the mouse, you can see percentage breakdown on the left. Um, the big 70% Pac-Man there is our spare parts, which <laughs> also includes research and development. We went through different motors, as Brian talked about, uh, to figure out what would fit our design best. On the right-hand side, it gives you a good breakdown of what we ended up putting together on our mouse. Um, which is mostly motors and motor control, uh, a lot for the microcontroller, chassis, and power supply as well. And here's a, a dollar breakdown of, of our expenditures. Uh, we spent $496, which we were allotted $600 by SDSU, um, so we're under budget there. And the only budget item we were um, over again is spare parts. We, we didn't think we'd spend that much on research and development. 
Uh, the final balance, as you can see, is $136.31, which is well under the IEEE um, allotted amount of $500 to compete with in their competition. Uh, here's a little teaser video of what our mouse can do. If you want to see more, come out on Thursday for the competition or Friday for Design Day and see what we can do.